morning. So a few months ago, you may remember that uh, I presented some material on the types and anti-types, the types in the Old Testament found in the anti-type, the salvation we have in Christ. Uh, and the first of those was I devoted uh, a sermon to Psalm 22, uh, where we see David, King David of Israel, uh, suffering in the hands of enemies, and he's praying, and it doesn't seem like God is, is going to be with him. It seems like God may abandon him. Uh, it seems like the answer to his prayers are coming. And all of that foreshadowing, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus didn't doubt that the Father was with him, but others looking at him had that same viewpoint that David had had. It, you know, the, the, the Jews are arresting Jesus, they're, they're trying Jesus, they're convicting Jesus, they're turning him over to the Romans, he's going to be crucified. So you have Jesus surrounded by his enemies, and it, it looks like God has abandoned him. And, and yet, in both cases, God in fact was with David, and deliverance came. And God was with Jesus, and deliverance and the resurrection came. Uh, so we looked at, at that type of Christ, David, uh, and his situation as, as uh, a type of Jesus, the antitype. Uh, and then another lesson I did, where I tried to tackle three types of the Old Testament in one lesson. Uh, those were Abraham, the father offering his beloved son as a sacrifice, uh, foreshadowing God offering his beloved son as a sacrifice. And secondly, Joseph, who was sent by his father to his brethren. <coughs> his brethren rejected him and uh, were about to kill him, but in that case merely sold him for pieces of silver as a slave. Uh, down in Egypt, but down in Egypt, he uh, became in this situation where he was the salvation of those who had tried to get rid of him. All of that foreshadowing uh, Jesus, who was sent by his father to us, uh, and man rejected him, uh, and he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, but that put him in the position of being our Savior, the one who can save us. Uh, and the third one, I didn't get to in that lesson. Uh, I began the lesson, not sure if I was going to have time, because I watched the clock, I realized I surely didn't have time. And I only realized, as I was looking back on what I've preached here in the past months, that I never did go back and pick up that third example uh, that I didn't get to in that sermon. So we're going to do that this morning. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. <coughs> Clean out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover. What does that mean, that Christ is our Passover? So that's what I want us to look at this morning. And this is a reference to the Old Testament Passover event in Egypt. You've known that story probably since you were young. Uh, the Passover uh, was uh, the culmination of the, the ten plagues. And so we're going to look this morning at the Passover being a type of our salvation in Christ. Passo the Passover and the salvation in Christ. I want to look at just a little bit of background to uh, the Passover event in the Old Testament. Uh, here's a map of the ancient world. And I used the wrong side slide to make this presentation. So it's going off the screen a little bit, but I uh, hope you will... Uh, be able to, to be patient and understanding about that. The background of the Passover in the Old Testament, kind of the distant background to it. In Genesis chapter 12, God had made some promises to Abraham. Where did Abraham live? Abraham lived in uh, the lower part of Mesopotamia. Uh, Mesopotamia. 
Mesopotamia is this land over here between the rivers. Abraham lived right down around here in the city of Ur. And God some, made some promises to Abraham at that point. Chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. He's going to show him this land, the land of Canaan that would become Israel to the land that I will show you. And the one that, uh, what's my place here? Uh, and I will make you a great nation, verse 2, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless them who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so God says, I want you to go to that land. And so he does. He leaves Ur and Mesopotamia and comes over to this land, the land that God is promising to him and his descendants. And then we read in verse 5 uh, those events. And Abram uh, took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. This land God had promised them, verses 6 and 7. And Abraham passed through, through the land as far as the site of Shechem, to the east of Monet, Morat. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. This is where God wanted Abraham and his descendants, the nation of Israel, to be. This is the land that he promised to them. And yet, you know the continuing story. Uh, Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons, including Joseph. Uh, Joseph, who uh, was sold into Egypt, and uh, then with the, the famine and the food that by the wisdom of God had been saved up in Egypt. Um, and uh, Joseph invites all his family, his brothers, his father, their whole clan, to come down to Egypt and live there. So Genesis chapter 46, verses 6 and 7. Genesis 46, verse 6. And they took their livestock and their property which they had acquired in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters and all the descendants he brought with him to Egypt. So, God was giving this land to Israel. And yet we find, and I'm not saying that this was in contradiction to, to what God wanted to happen. Clearly God wanted them to go down to Egypt. But, but it is the different place than the land that he promised to Abraham, the land where uh, he, you know, the intended land of these people. But instead now, they're in this other place, this foreign place, Egypt. Uh, and for hundreds of years, they are down there in Egypt, not the place God ultimately wanted them to be. And furthermore, they're enslaved down in Egypt. They are slaves to the Egyptians, and they're helpless to escape that situation. They couldn't get out. And those were important concepts for us, and we'll get to those and discuss them a bit more in the course of our study this morning. But they are away from kind of their intended place. They're in this foreign place. They're not in the place that God had promised where they would live, where they would be eventually. Um, and they're enslaved there. They're slaves to the Egyptians, a situation that they cannot seem to escape. All right, so um, I want us to run through a number of these parallels between that situation and the salvation that we have in Christ. One, uh, one aspect of the plight that they are in 
is that they are in this foreign place. And that's, that's similar to the New Testament concept of, of understanding our situation as we stand before God, and as has been the situation of all men since the time of Adam and Eve, there was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And they were in fellowship with God. There was harmony between them and God. That's where God intended them to be. And yet then they sinned. And uh, that fellowship was broken. And they are then in a place God did not intend them ultimately to be. And so we read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. Uh, the situation that man has been in since they lived several years and, and began to understand the difference between right and wrong and then sin against God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God, in the world. God wants us with him. And we were with him. When we're born into this world where there's no conflict between us and God. And we grow up and we learn the difference between right and wrong and, and then we sin. We make choices we shouldn't make. And we're not in that place. Well, I've left my map now so I can't point up to the screen anymore. Uh, but we're not in the place where God intends us to be. We're off in this, this other place. And that's the situation with us spiritually. Um, being in a, a place foreign to his promises and separated. And that was the situation of Israel. Furthermore, as we pointed out a moment ago, that Israel was enslaved. The, the descendants of uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were enslaved in Egypt. Exodus chapter 1. By the way, you might want to put a marker if you have one in your Bible. Uh, actually, you'll probably want your marker at Exodus chapter 12 because that's the passage we'll be going back to a lot in the course of our study this morning. But right now, Exodus chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 1, uh, I'm sorry, verse 11, so they appointed taskmasters, the Egyptians did, the Egyptians appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh's storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. And then verses 13 and 14. And the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and at all kinds of labor in the field, and all their labors which they rigorously imposed upon them. Egyptians took these Israelites and made slaves out of them. The, Egyptians, the, the Israelites are now enslaved to the Egyptians. And that's parallel to our situation when we're not in the place where God wants us to be with him, but we've sinned and we've gone off and we're in this place where God did not ultimately intend for us to be. And we're enslaved to sin there. Paul makes that, uh, uses that description of our situation in sin a number of times in the New Testament. We'll notice one, Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin... You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. We're born into fellowship with God, then we sin and we are slaves to that sin because we can't escape it. Just like the Israelites could not escape their slavery in Egypt, there's nothing that we can do on our own to escape the situation of slavery to sin. You can start doing right and living right, but you're still a slave of the fact that you sinned against God and the consequences of that are going to come. We can't escape that on our own. But Christ came into the world and saw that, and we'll be getting to that point here in a few moments. So the Israelites were in a foreign place, 
not where God ultimately wanted them to be. And they were enslaved there, as we are enslaved to sin. But then came one day there in Egypt, one night there in Egypt, immediately after which the Israelites were able to return to that place, to that realm where God wanted them to be, the land that he had promised to them, the land of Canaan. So that night was the culmination of those ten plagues, uh, again, that you learned about when you were young, probably. Uh, the tenth plague was the, the, the death of the firstborn in all of the land of Egypt. The death of the firstborn in all of the land of Egypt. Well, the Israelites were in Egypt. That would include them, except for the plan that God set forth. God ordered the Israelites to make a sacrifice, a sacrifice of the lamb, after which they would be free to return from this land they weren't, uh, I shouldn't say that they weren't supposed to be in, because that was part of God's plan. But this land that was not the intended place for them, ultimately, the place where they were in slavery, immediately after the sacrifice were offered, they were able to escape that and go back to the land God intended them to be in. And that sacrifice was the Passover land. And that story is told in Exodus chapter 12, and now is when we'll start going uh, back and forth between Exodus 12 and passages in the New Testament, Exodus 12 and passages in the New Testament for the rest of our lesson. That sacrifice there that they were to offer that night was a lamb. They were to make a sacrifice, and that sacrifice was a lamb. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel. This is just before that tenth plague hits, the death of the firstborn. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. And then in verse 6, And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it, to kill that lamb at twilight. So there is sacrifice, an animal, and that sacrifice should be a lamb. We get to the New Testament, and John the Baptist is preaching. Uh, he's preparing the people to hear Jesus. He's preparing the hearts of the people where they will put their faith in Jesus and follow Jesus. And he's been telling them about the Messiah who's coming after him, Jesus. And we read in John chapter 1, verse 36. Again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The reason John referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God is because the Israelites were used to sacrificing a lamb as a way to uh, be forgiven of their sins, uh, particularly the Passover lamb, but lambs uh, year-round uh, on occasions when they had sinned a, a lamb, or sometimes a goat would be offered, or sometimes a calf, but primarily the lamb, and certainly with the Passover. It was the lamb that was offered, and, and yet those sacrifices never actually, in and of themselves, achieved redemption without the sacrifice of Christ. The Israelites have been offering lambs year after year for forgiveness, and yet none of those actually achieved redemption, as we learn in the book of Hebrews. But God is offering his lamb now, Jesus the lamb. And that's why I think John refers to him uh, as he's pointing him out to, to others who are there listening to John. Behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb that God is offering. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed by perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, they were in slavery to sin, that way of life that they had been in. 
but they weren't redeemed with silver or gold from that, verse 19, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless of the blood of Christ. So the sacrifice of the Old Testament Passover was a lamb. And the, <coughs> the sacrifice in the New Testament is Jesus, the lamb. That lamb, as we just read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, was to be without blemish, uh, or, or was without blemish. Um, but back in Exodus chapter 12, when God is giving the Israelites instructions for the Passover night, and the lamb that they are to choose that month in order to sacrifice that night, says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. An unblemished male. Somebody asked me just a couple of weeks ago, what does that mean, unblemished? Well, they were to take a lamb that was born blind or had a, a lame leg or or some disease, it's like, well, I've got to sacrifice this lamb because God wants me to, uh, but I don't want to lose any of my good lambs. Here, I'll get rid of this one with the lame leg. I'll offer that to God. God says, no, no. You offer me an unblemished male. No, no mar, no flaw to it. Well, there's, we see the reasoning in that, that they shouldn't offer something inferior to God and keep the good for themselves. We see that principle. But also it foreshadowed Jesus, the unblemished lamb. Uh, we just read a moment ago in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, um, or uh, verse 19, actually. 1 Peter 1, 19. Uh, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And uh, the, the meaning of that uh, is alluded to in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus lived an unblemished life. A life that was unmarred by sin. Jesus sacrificed in that he was the lamb being given by the Father. He was an unblemished sacrifice. There was no mark on him, uh, no mark of sin upon him. He was the perfect sacrifice. Back in Exodus chapter 12 again, uh, the Israelites were saved by the blood of that lamb, saved from uh, the death of their firstborn and prepared them to immediately afterwards to go back to the, to the realm where God intended them to be. Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood, the blood from that lamb they have killed as a sacrifice, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So they kill this lamb. That's a bloody affair. And they take some of that blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the doors of their homes that night. Verses 12 and 13. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all from the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. And that's why this is called the Passover. Because God was passing over them that night as he is going and slaying the firstborn of all who are in Egypt. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. If you notice, uh, when you mark your song books at number 200 this morning, that song takes that image and applies it 
to us, that God will pass over us when he sees the blood of Christ on us. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the blood of Christ saved them, and it saves us, again as we just read a moment ago in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, we've not been saved by blood or silver, verse 19, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The next thing I want to mention here, oh, I forgot to advance my slide. Uh, but the next thing I want to mention here is this business about the bones that is mentioned in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. When the, we're reading these instructions uh, for the sacrifice of this Passover lamb on this night of the Passover in Egypt, verse 46, it is to be eaten in a single house. They were to eat the meat of this lamb uh, as part of a meal that night that would become the Passover meal. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. In the Old Testament setting, I'm not sure why it was important that... <clears throat> I thought I was going to sneeze. i have been fighting it for a moment, and I, I was about to give up, but now it's gone. Um, I'm not sure why in the Old Testament scenario it was important that the bones not be broken of this lamb, but I do know why it was important for the antitype in the life of Jesus, why, uh, why God instructed them, when you offer this lamb, the Passover lamb, don't break any bones because God knew that that would be the situation with his son, on the cross, John chapter 19, beginning in verse 31. John chapter 19, verse 31 through 36. This is uh, picking up in the crucifixion narrative immediately after Jesus died there on the cross. Verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the day of preparation, the day of preparation for the Passover, so that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The crucifixion was on Friday. The day following was the Sabbath. And they shouldn't have dying or dead bodies hanging around on crosses on the Sabbath. Especially that Sabbath, as it was a high Sabbath. And so, because the next day was a Sabbath, there at the end of verse 31, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Why break their legs? When you're hanging on a cross, uh, you are hanging, suspended from your wrists where you're nailed. And to breathe, you have to push with your feet up to be able to enable your lungs to inhale air and then to exhale air. If you, they break your legs, you can no longer push with your feet to rise up and catch your breath. And so to hasten their deaths, because that, the object of crucifixion was to make people suffer for a long time. But in this case, the next day being Sabbath, and they didn't want bodies hanging around on the Sabbath, they asked that their legs might be broken so that they would suffocate and die and they could be taken down from the crosses. Jesus and these two thieves. Verse 32, two, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other man who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. Don mentioned in class this morning uh, that from Ephesians chapter <coughs> Three, am I thinking right? That was chapter 3. Um, that this was the eternal plan uh, in Christ. The eternal God, the plan that God had in Christ. And God knew this eternal plan from the beginning. And so he knew 
that Jesus' legs were not going to be broken on the cross. And so, at the Passover, he told them this lamb that God in his own mind knew was going to foreshadow Jesus on the cross, he told those Israelites, break no bone of that lamb. So I'm not going to have any bones of Jesus broken on the cross. Also, in that text we just read, back in Exodus chapter 12, is that none of uh, that lamb was to be left until the morning. We just read uh, in John chapter 19 that the Jews uh, were insistent that because the next day was a Sabbath day, that the bodies would not be left on the cross. And so back in Exodus chapter 12, verse 10, in the instructions for this Passover sacrifice, uh, the verses leading up to verse 10 are about eating the flesh of this lamb as part of that Passover meal. And then verse, uh, what did I say, 11. Now you shall eat it in this manner with the loins girded. Um, not verse 11, verse 10. And you shall not leave any of it over until the morning. But whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Then we're not to leave this lamb until the next day. And of course, that's what we just read in John chapter 19, that they weren't going to leave the body of Jesus hanging until the next day. They were not to be left. Jesus wasn't going to be left until the next day, and so God told the Israelites, don't leave any of this lamb until the morning. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, we read that there was a memorial established for the people of God, for the people of Israel, to remember that sacrifice that night, their salvation that night in Egypt, when they were saved from their slavery and were able then to return to the realm that God wanted them ultimately to be in. Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. Uh, now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. And they were to eat the lamb again. Every year, regularly, they would have really a reenactment of this Passover feast. When they would prepare the lamb again and they would eat that lamb each year, remembering the salvation that they had been given in Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verses 42 through 46. Exodus 12, beginning in verse 42. It is a night to be observed for the Lord uh, for having brought them out from the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. But every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house, you are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. A permanent ordinance in Israel. Every year to have this memorial feast to remember that Passover sacrifice, that Passover night, in which they were redeemed by God. Well, you see the parallel. Uh, and this passage was read a few moments ago, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, Paul writes to the Corinthians, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As the Israelites were to have that regular remembrance, that memorial feast, to remember the night of their salvation, Jesus had told the disciples, this is my body, which is 
before you do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the Israelites were given this memorial. And in this memorial, the lamb was to be eaten every year. They eat that lamb, the Passover lamb, again. And we're given a memorial to look back and remember Jesus Christ, our Passover. And in the memorial that we are given, the Lord's Supper, every first day of the week, we remember and we eat the body of Jesus the lamb, representatively, in that bread and in that cup. Um, so the memorial, the lamb to be eaten in the observance of that memorial. And in the Old Testament, with the, that Passover night, that led to their immediate escape from slavery. That led to their immediate redemption by God. God buying them back from their slavery to lead them back to the realm he always intended for them to be, the land of Canaan. Exodus chapter 12, verse 51. And it came about on that same day that the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. They've been in this foreign place. It was by the plan of God that they were there. And I think part of the reason for that plan was so that this could foreshadow our salvation in Christ. They've been in this foreign land, a place, a place that was not ultimately the realm God wanted them to be in, the realm that God had promised to them, the, the land flowed with milk and honey. Now they're down here in Egypt, and they're in slavery in Egypt. And the Passover leads to their immediate escape from that so that they can return to the place God wanted them to be. Exodus chapter 12, verse 51, we just read that God brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt that same day. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, as Paul writes about the situation we were in after we were in sin and after we were away from the place God had intended us to be in fellowship with him, in a relationship with him. We were lost in sin. And we were enslaved in sin as the Israelites were enslaved to the Egyptians in that place that was a foreign place to them. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ, our Passover. And so, as we look at this, and all of these parallels, in Israel you had the people in a foreign place. They are enslaved there. Their escape, their, their ability be, to be redeemed from that situation was to offer a sacrifice. That sacrifice was a lamb. That lamb must be without blemish. They are saved by the blood of that lamb as God passed over them that night. And they were not to break any bones of that lamb that they offered that night. None of it was to be left until the morning. God commanded a regular remembrance, a regular memorial of that sacrifice. And in that sacrifice, they were again to eat the lamb each year. And that led to the people immediately to escape the slavery to Egypt to immediately leave Egypt to return to the place God always wanted them to be. You see the parallels with the story of Christ. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul refers to Jesus as Christ, our, our Passover. Christ, our Passover also. 
has been sacrificed. The perfect lamb who brings us back from slavery to God. I'm going to go back and read one more verse from Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. As God told the Israelites at that time, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Verse 13, And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's the promise that we have in Christ. Jesus the Lamb was offered and sacrificed on that Passover in the third year of his public ministry in Judea. And so this song, song number 200, was written with this whole background in mind that when it comes to the time of judgment, God will look at us and he will see the blood of Christ and he will pass over us in his judgment of the world. He will pass over us when he sees the blood. If you have some need this morning, to uh, come before us, uh, to be redeemed from your sins. Uh, you look like you're ready to actually be. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, that will be the, the starting note or the key? Uh, give me the key, please. So if you have me this morning, will you come as we stand and say, Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sin.